I actually have briefed the Secretary of Defense, which, look, is not an uncommon thing. He ran all of Iraq. And when we were there, he talked about how he wrote the paper. He did. He wrote the paper on advising and assisting and, and building the capability of, of a foreign military. Well, we failed at that. And then that man has stood there and looked into the camera, just like I'm doing, and said, I don't know how many Americans are in Afghanistan, Israel, Yemen, nor can I protect them. All right, we are here with the illustrious return of Pete A. Turner. Haven't talked to Pete since, well, the debacle that they called a withdrawal in Afghanistan. And those who have been following me for a while know that I avoid talking about Ukraine because I don't speak the language, I'm not familiar with their history, and I don't like to speak to things with which I have little knowledge. Now, what I do have knowledge of, though, is money pouring out of our coffers and going overseas for whatever the reason. So I don't... I think that you can take a stance whatever side you are on and still be against the money being spent overseas. So, Pete, you're going to help me understand what is going on, and you're going to uh, convince me, let me guess, that it's really a good thing that we have spent, according to an article you sent me, more money on Ukraine than we did in Afghanistan over 12 years. Help me understand. Well, first off, thanks for having me on your show, man. I, I appreciate it. And and I always appreciate being on anybody's show, but I also consider you a friend and it's cool to be able to chat with you. So I'll, I'll get the niceties out of the way, but they're from the heart and I appreciate it. Uh, here, here's the thing. You don't have to know Ukraine. You have to know us. And what we love to do is, and I'll just be blunt and say this, we love to export our problems. And so we uh, spend a lot of money. We don't really care where it goes because we don't act like it. We might say that we care where it goes, but the reality is, is we don't act like someone who's buying something and getting return on our investment. So you go to a place like Iraq or Afghanistan or Somalia, wherever it's going to be, and we just think that we can come in, that we, we know all the problems and we have all the answers. And what ends up happening is, is we, we become the corrupter. We have corruption ourselves. We kill people on their side and our side because we don't take this stuff uh, as seriously. War is hard, man. War is hard. And we're going to go to Ukraine. We're going to go to Israel. We're going to get involved. And when it comes to military stuff, yeah, we're pretty good at that. But the social, cultural, political, religious, economic, we don't have a reliable, repeatable path. Okay. Help me understand this because I feel like when you repeat the same thing, over and over and over and you always get the same results but you keep doing it now in um in a i think that's called you know insanity is repeating the same thing over and over and expecting yeah. different results but maybe i'm conspiracy minded it seems to me that if you keep repeating the same thing with the same results then perhaps you are getting the results that you do desire and i just am not seeing what the actual desired outcome is. It might be worse than that, just to be honest with you. I'm going to give you a quick example. I'm not going to get into specifics with it, but there was a power plant that we designed and built in Iraq. And we thought, hey, you know what uh, the Afghans need is they need some, some electricity. So we're going to take that plant plan. We're going to implement it in, in Afghanistan. And we um, fail to understand that Iraq has plentiful energy in the dirt. Like I, I talked to a farmer one time there and he said, I can light the dirt in my yard on fire, but I don't have electricity. What gives, right? So now you go to Afghanistan where that isn't true, where they don't have oil just seeping out of the ground. And you have to bring in enormous amounts of fuel to run this plant to, to make electricity. Enormous amounts. Like just not available, right? And it's not tenable because there's barely roads in a lot of Afghanistan. So they destabilized the village. They uh, allowed a bunch of government officials to take land from actual Afghans. They have built this plant for an excess of $100 million. And it has never, not for one second, run because there's no way to reliably get fuel to it. That is what we do. So yes, there's the insanity part, but there's also just the brazen drunkenness with, with which we spend money. They're not that stupid. I mean, there's a certain point where, you know, they're stupid or liar. And, and I can't help but say, again, 
if you keep doing it, somebody's getting paid. You just mentioned a power plant, right? Yeah. Who built that? Yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, there's contractors contractor? that build it. Yeah, absolutely. There's contractors that build it. And what's and whether they're the American other? or European, it's all the same thing. Right. So is this what we are in essence doing as a money laundering scheme to corporations? You know, that would be a little cynical. Uh, I don't know that it's untrue. I don't think they do adjust for that. I do think that, that, look, there's a lot of great people that are brilliant. They've got educations. They're smart. But they don't have the stack of skills required to get these things right. So let's just give everybody the benefit of the doubt that we do want to do good things. But our foreign policy is so off, right? It just doesn't line up with what reality is on the ground. And that's how you get this plant that we always say it briefs well. That briefs well. You know, we're, we're going to go out and we're going to teach women how to weave carpets to give them independence. So, well, that briefs well. It looks beautiful. And you can picture us going to a village and taking pictures of women. Like, oh, thank you for this thing. But then you're not there 10 minutes later or 10 years later or 10 days. You're never there again. And so you have no idea what you've done. And so we just pack these good feeling moments together. And uh, and the ethics, right? We, we deal with ethics. When, you're, when you go to a place like that, the ethics are there. You're jumping into someone else's ethical reality. And you can't reliably do something that is ethical over and over again if you don't act like ethics are actually important to you. So you can assume that you're going to improve the condition of women. But if you don't understand the condition of women, you can't reliably improve it. So I would say don't be too cynical. But be, And this is why, why we started our institution. A lot of us got PTSD from the fact that we watch us repeat the same mistakes over and over again, right? And so what we want to try to do is go, okay, if you're going to have someone go out, let's first off have the right goals and, and put them in the right order and actually be able to accomplish them. Have a third party assess them and then uh, wait on the things like female empowerment until you understand how to navigate that landscape. I'm not saying that female empowerment is not important. A, a peer review paper on it, but you can't just run in and do it because you think it will be the right thing because we don't reliably, to your point, we don't reliably do that ever. Like we never have a reliable path to whatever that goal is. My question though is why do we even have to go out there to begin with? Well, yeah, I mean, that's a good question. And, and do we belong out there? And we're not going to be in isolation this country. We just, we just haven't been for a long time. And, and why do we have to go? I mean, with Ukraine, you could say there's some sense in it. You don't want Europe to, to fall into disrepair and turn into a bigger problem. We are trying to nip some of this in the bud. You know, with, when it comes to Ukraine and Russia, we would love what, what we're planning yeah, for, okay, what we what, want is a stalemate. At that cost? I mean, we're, we're out spending oh, the entire well. Russian military budget. Out, I mean, come on. And, and we're not even yeah. trying to rebuild infrastructure or anything. It's just being shredded. It's just money. We might as well set the money on fire. It is in, completely insane. Um, can it get worse? Can I? Can, can we go worse? I'm, I'm, <laughs> I mean, I'm sure. So, give, give them time. I mean, somebody's making. Yeah, that money's going somewhere. Okay, and you know, I think yeah, of Sam there's Bankman a lot of Freed. corruption out there. I, I think of you know different things going on, and that. Is, is haunting me because I can't, I'm like, what? I, I don't even feel like we should even be there. This is a, yeah. a long known corruption. Half of it, maybe we instigated ourselves with um, sure. in 2014, things like that. And, you know, why do we care so much? Why do we care so much yeah. about a um, extremely corrupt country? Yeah, and are you talking about Russia or Ukraine or both, right? It, it's uh, the thing. We are also just as corrupt, though. You know, my, my peers hate to hear that, but the reality is, is we show up with money to bypass the system, you know, and we'll say things like, hey, there's no rule of law there. Of course, there's rule of law there. You may not like that flavor of rule of law, but, but they deal with things like murder and lawsuits and all these other things. So, of course, there's rule of law. The, um, you know, again, look, to your point, I don't control whether or not we go places. I just know we go places. So if we're going to say we shouldn't go as many places, hey, I'm, I'm all for trying that process out. But, but we love going places, and that's what we're built to do. We just suck at it, so we get people killed. And so, yeah, maybe we should go to fewer places. I mean, we certainly haven't helped Somalia. We certainly haven't helped Syria with all these, all these programs that we Libya. put together. Haiti is not any better off. So, yeah, maybe we shouldn't go. No, you got Libya too. I mean, with open slave markets, the uh, list is long. <laughs> yeah. It, it, yeah, it is. I mean, and uh, I'm I, 
you know, and uh, by the way, I'm not, I don't want us to go to Israel either. I, I think that they have, they have a very capable defense. I say we just, you know, God bless, do your thing. We, we, we don't mm -hmm. have to, you know, send our troops over there. We don't have to do that, in my opinion. Yeah. And I'm well, very concerned. And, and I don't think we want to send our troops in mass to either of those places, but they're there in the region. There's a lot more American troops in Poland. We've got a whole new post there where we will be working with the Poles. Right. And so even if we don't directly go there, that presence is there. If you ever look at all of the American backed facilities that surround Iran, if you were Iran, you'd be pissed. You'd be like, hey, man, get off my back. But it rings the entire country. So it rings how much world. of this? Have you seen all the military um, placements in the world on a map? Yeah. It, it there are so many. Like, uh, it looks like a red map of the United States and counties. <laughs> <laughs> it, it does. There are so many American service members and and uh, and their and their kin, right? Contract companies. Like, look, a long time I was a Department of Army civilian, right? So I, I swear in, I can wear a uniform, but I'm not in the army. I'm I'm with the army or for the army, right? You take all of those people worldwide, and uh, you, the president and President Trump tried this. He's like, "How many people do we have abroad?" And the generals were like, "I don't know. It's really hard to count." You know, and, and if you were a lieutenant and you said, where are, where are your 25 dudes? You'd have to know every single person. Or you'd look to your sergeant and be like, where are all my guys? And they'd be like, yeah, there's one at sick call. There are 10 doing KP. You know, and you would know every single but But you get to a certain level, we lose track of all of it. That's how spread out and big we are. Okay, so how do we get to this point? And I think this is a bipartisan thing, by the way. I'm, I think I have to pick on... Um, I, I'm just going to say the corporatists in our government, because I, I feel like that there are people on both the left and the right, however you want to put it, who are anti-war and are not building up. Um, Donald Trump actually was less of a hawk than others, in my opinion. I mean, he's. I think it's the only time that our presence overseas hasn't grown was during the presidency there. We actually were working on withdrawing. Um where I'm going with it, though, is some of these people you've worked with personally who are making decisions. Now, uh, would the Secretary of Defense be one of those? I actually have briefed the Secretary of Defense, which, look, is not an uncommon thing. He ran all of Iraq. And when we were there, he talked about how he wrote the paper. He did. He wrote the paper on advising and assisting and, and building the capability of, of a foreign military. Well, we failed at that. And then that man has stood there and looked into the camera, just like I'm doing, and said, I don't know how many Americans are in Afghanistan, Israel, Yemen, nor can I protect them. So I'm not saying that Lloyd is a bad guy. I'm not saying that Secretary Austin doesn't know how to do his job. I just know that it's not working. And when I see what happens and how we respond, I know that these things don't work. And I watch us do the same things over and over again. It's... It, it's it doesn't matter if Afghanistan is different than, say, Somalia. We bring the same playbook. I, I promise you, Eric, I promise you this is going to happen. When we go to, uh, to Ukraine to help them rebuild, we're going to teach Ukrainian farmers how to farm. That is in the playbook. It's, it's in the chapter called Farming. And we're going to go there, and we're going to go there with the most ridiculous ideas. And it, it doesn't work. It didn't work in Iraq. Look, you can't teach an Iraqi farmer on the Tigris how to farm. He already knows how to farm. You can go to him and say, hey, man, what do you need? He's going to say simple things like feed and seed. You know, we'll make these assumptions and we'll say, I, I, hand to God, this is me in a room. I'm watching this happen. And they'll say, here's, here's why we want to help the Iraqi farmer, because we want them to have to hire people and boost the economy. So I go out, I do my job. And I'm like, hey, man, if you have a bumper crop, what are you going to do? He's like, oh, I'm going to call my cousin. We're going to bring the crop in. Well, what would it take for you to have to hire anybody else out or build a factory? Like, what? No, never. I can never have a crop so big that I won't be able to reap it with my family. I just, I'll just hire another cousin. I'd never hire anybody else. And so you have these, this complete disconnect from reality. And, and that's the big problem is we are going to go. So how do we get better at doing it? Okay, so I'm going to get cynical on you again, but there you go. It, it sounds to me it. like you have a template and a program and it has nothing to do with actually helping the recipients it is a matter of paying off everybody you know who's part of it. Like, 
For example, the trainers to show them how to farm are probably going to also say you have to buy Monsanto. And we need I mean, the proper fertilizer and we got to get this and yeah. we got to get that. And and I do kind of wonder, is that all this is, is really the biggest grift in the world? Hmm. I don't want to say yes to that. Uh, there are elements of that are true and elements of that, from my experience, are not true. It's not driven by Monsanto. It's driven by... No, look, it's just an I'm example. I'm going to be honest here. A, a lot of this is driven by... by, by um, left focused dreams. So we'll do things like, Hey, you, you Ukrainian farmers are going to need to set up a co-op. We'll give you a tractor that you guys can borrow and then you can drive around and do whatever. Right. And so it'll be things like that. Or, um, when we go to Ukraine, who also has a ton of energy in their dirt, mm -hmm. we'll say, you know what the new answer is solar. And so instead of allowing them to use what's readily available, and, and rebound with that will we'll force them into this startup culture. And so we'll say, hey, what you need is an office dog, a ping pong table, and, and try to turn them into a Silicon Valley uh, farming agricultural firm. And, and that's just, look, that's adorable. That's nice. That's cute that, that we think that that's going to work. But what really works is, look, let me back up. At some point when this tie happens between Ukraine and Russia, uh, Russia is going to own a significant portion of Ukraine. And maybe that's the right answer to reduce the uh, the harm. But what we don't want is a, is, a, is a constant fight back and forth, right? And so Ukraine is likely to lose a lot of its eastern region, where a lot of people there think they're Russian already. So, okay, no harm, no foul. But that's where a lot of the industrial capacity for Ukraine is. So, so where's that going to go? They're going to build that in the West. Ukraine, you've talked to the business leaders of Ukraine. They want to be tied to the West. They're tired of looking to the East, even though they're going to be neighbors with Russia after this conflict. They want to be, look, they, they want to be like a China version. Uh, they want to build our stuff for us. They want to partner with us and they want to have industrial capacity. So who's going to build that? But there's nobody in the State Department that wants to hear that. They don't want to hear, yeah, let's let's build a titanium uh, plant. Let's, let's uh, focus on fertilizer because this is what Ukraine is good at. They don't want that. They want to create other things. So when your cynicism comes in, Think more about, um, I hate to say ideology because that's a little bit unfair, but think more about how uh, you would, look, who works at the State Department? It, it's, it's, not, it's not folks from Texas who drive pickup trucks across West Texas in the oil and gas business. It's not those folks. And those folks, by the way, and I'm going to get down and feed your cynicism here. The folks in the State Department also work with a thing called the Atlantic Council, which is a think tank. Guess who funds that? Well, Clinton Foundation. Uh, two of the biggest oligarchs in Ukraine, Shell Oil, uh, <laughs> it just goes on and on, man. The, the, uh, the head of the Atlantic Council said, you know who should run the, uh, the World uh, Environmental Forum? Those guys in, in, in uh, the, Saudi, the Saudi Peninsula. And they got called out on it. You know, like, hey, you can't just say these things because the Saudi Peninsula, you know, I think it was the UAE or maybe it was Qataris, whoever was going to host it this year. They contributed $100 million to the Atlantic Council. So, of course, the ideas come out of Atlantic Council, say, hey, this is what you want to do. So you have all these ideas that are in no way tied to reality. They're, they're tied to a belief of what reality might be. But along the way, hey, we need $100 million. So let's have these, um, these petrochemical princes. Let, let's have them um, host and, uh, and speak positively about what the environment's going to be in 25 years. True and... Um, I'm trying to think of the right term because hey, I, I would say that it's there's a certain amount of racism, but um, I guess I'll say paternalization. It 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 okay. seems like what you are describing is that these countries are too stupid to do anything on their own. That they there's don't know how to farm. They don't know how to do this. They don't know how to do that. We're going to have to go in there and show them everything except for wiping their butts. And that is a, it's kind of insulting to the people, in my opinion. Am I that far off? You are hitting the nail squarely on the head. Not only is it insulting, it's infantilism. And so there's all kinds of things that you, and you, I hear these things. Even in the, in the media, you'll, you'll hear people say these things. This is true. We would go to, say, Afghanistan or Iraq, and we would go and take our women to engage their women. Sounds beautiful, right? Briefs well. And they're like, women have periods. You need a maxi pad. 
That's how you, and, and we would teach women about periods in, in conflict zones. And the thing is, is like, that is so, so it's exactly what you're talking about. Or, or we'll, um, we'll, we'll build the Afghans. We built you a well. Okay, matter of fact, let's do this right now. Mr. Beast went out and dug a hundred wells in Africa, right? Here's the thing. That's beautiful. That briefs well. But here's the problem. You have no idea what you've done. First off, when you create fresh water, you also have wastewater. What's Mr. Beast going to do about that? And everybody's like, well, what do you mean wastewater? Well, farming, washing dishes, pooping and peeing, all that stuff, right? There's all this wastewater now. So you've given a country one thing, but created another problem. And then there's the neighbor. What happened to the neighbor over there? You can be invited. It doesn't mean you're not being played for advantage. And so someone like Mr. Beast, look, I'm not against Mr. Beast. I think what he's trying to do is great, but you have to have pros that come in and say, whoa, slow down. You know, let's go there and make sure that this is what we need to do. Not, not just go punch a hole in the, what if all hundred of those wells that he dug in that area, that aquifer belongs to somebody else? What? What if, what if there's a guy already in that region who handles water affairs? Because there is. In Islam, they have a guy has got a name, right? It's got a job title. And if you don't deal with that, you've just smashed over the top of the existing system. So these are the things that we do that brief well. So yeah, so your cynicism and in, in your, in your critique is, is fair because we do go there, right? Another thing you'll hear is, you know, look how hard the Ukrainians fight. The Afghans never fought that hard for their own country. Mm. What the Afghans did was they had deals, backdoor deals, because they're trying to deal with conflict that's going to remain after we left. And so when we look at that as being weak or cowardly, they're saying, hey, we outlasted you. We outlasted the Russians. We outlasted the Brits. We outlast each other. We always make side deals. So the second we said we're leaving and we, as we walked out, they all had their backdoor deals going and they were going to remain because if you don't, the Taliban will come and cut your head off. So of course they hedged. They have to hedge. That's the reality of the ground. Which is pretty dark and pretty sad. And yeah. now uh, the, the pull point for this episode is Pete A. Turner shits all over Mr. Beast. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that one I didn't see coming because I actually was encouraged by the motivation of just getting out there and actually doing something without yeah. all of the siphoning of funds that typically occurs in a lot of areas where they could use a well. I mean, a, a, a well does change lives and yeah, you're right. It yeah. can cause problems too, obviously, hopefully you can deal yeah. with it, but isn't it a net positive? The idea of being able to at least get fresh water, having a source, yeah, I mean, maybe not it, walking five miles to get it or whatever every day. See, okay. So this is the thing in the, in the aid world. It's not as simple as that. So the first thing is, is uh, if you care, you have to go back and you have to study and it can't be Mr. Beast that does that. It can't be about a wow video. You got to have a hard dude who can go out there and be like, I'm going to go live amongst these people and understand what's going on. Then he'll, he'll tell you if you've done a good job, right? And, and if you have, then great. Then you have, you have a model. You might be able to repeat in the next village. But the next village, that might get someone killed. You, you just don't know. And so if you don't care enough to care, look, you can't, even if you get invited there, remember, there's someone's always, there's not enough stuff where we're going, right? So you go to that part of Africa if someone's like, hey, I can get Mr. I want Mr. Beast's attention. It would help me out. It would help you out. I mean, mm -hmm. the guy can command millions of people, right? So if you're in Africa, you're like, hey, what if we got Mr. Beast to show up? How could we then improve our position? Well, that position comes at the cost of somebody else. And so you don't know how that society works. You just come in and you're punching a hole gun. Do I want people to drink bad water? Hell no. But if it was that easy to solve, you know what Africa would be rich with? They'd have water everywhere. Because it's just not that easy to solve. Look at Haiti. Haiti is still screwed up. They, they but, can't but even. Is that? Yeah, that's a corruption problem, from what I understand. You know, all right. Well, the, the it, corruption when, in the government, he went, and whatever else. Yeah, but corruption comes in a lot of forms. And so, what Mr. Beast has done is he's corrupted what normally is there. So, whatever the government can or can't or won't do, um, he's just overridden that. Whatever the village balance was, he's just corrupted that. He's brought capacity in without checking his work. And then look, maybe it worked, but we don't know because no one's gone out there. Look, let me go out there in six months. Show me where every, every well is and I'll report back. Now, would it be surprised if I find out that there's a lot of bad things that have happened? Some of the wells go dry. Um, maybe that maybe look, I can promise you someone's going to get killed from those wells. That absolutely is going to happen. Someone's going to be like, this is Ricky. He's in charge of well 15. And someone's going to be like, no, he's not. And they're going to smoke him. 
And then the next kid's going to get it. And they're like, you know what? Kid number two after Ricky, he's not in charge either. And someone else is going to smoke him. It's a resource. And when you don't have enough resources, people kill each other over it. The, uh, they use bombs as, as a form of political influence. And so it, you know, I'm not saying it's the worst thing in the world. What I'm saying is, is that when you don't handle it professionally, when you don't have a license to work on the ground, and I mean, that's like through like making a lot of mistakes, and understanding it's never as simple as that. Because if it was, we would just punch holes in the ground and be like, here, everybody can have wells. Let me give you an example. You talked about walking five miles. We like to go to Afghanistan, punch a hole in the ground, and go, hey, look, here's your well. And they're like, yeah, that gets us killed. The Taliban comes around, they're like, ah, so you're tied to the Americans. Whoever uses this well is going to get killed. And so that well is left alone. Or the women will say, hey, uh, we don't want there to be a well in the middle of town. We want to walk five miles because that's where our community, that's how the female side of our community talks and exchanges information out of the watchful eye of all of these dudes that we live with. And, and look, it, here's the thing. I'm going to give you a resource right now. Benedict A. Grima has written about all of her work in the field. She's a She's an ethnographer and she'll tell you, and I, like, I know this lady and she said, um, I asked her, I was like, what, what level can you have enough cultural capacity to be able to go out and do things like engage women in, in the posture part of the world? She's like, never, you can't do it. You should never do it. That's how hard this stuff is. Here's a woman who spent her life inculcating in so she can study and explain. And her advice is, is don't you dare do it because it's dangerous. So when we think it's simple and we can punch a hole in the ground and extract water and everything's going to be great. And it looks great on YouTube, but not in the ground. So it sounds like you're supporting something I argued all the way back in high school, self-determination. Literally, yeah, it, you stay the F out of their stuff and let them figure it out. I would say you can, you can reliably, you can, if you were slow down and understand that this thing is hard, you can take that self-determination and you can put a multiplier on it if we're committed to doing it. And also for a fraction of the cost, you don't got to spend $150 billion to mm -hmm. do this stuff, but you have to want to stay there. You have to accept slow progress. You have to accept that there's going to be problems and still people are going to die because this stuff is hard, but yeah, you have to, this is deliberate work. This is critical path work. It's not something you can short circuit and go, ta-da, we did this, right? Because uh, that's not how it works. That's just not, there's not so enough stuff. Is that, a, yeah. a, is that a, 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 an American, especially American mentality? And, and what I mean by that is, let me go to like MacArthur. Um, after World War II in Japan, the first thing he did was he did keep the emperor in power. Yeah. So all of their structure was in place versus like what we did in Iraq where he said, oh, sorry, you're, you're the bath party. You're out. So everybody who knew where all the switches were, where all the things were, they were out and they were pissed off and they were creating um, people against us. Is that our problem? Do we need to do the original form of kitchen nightmares? Like, hey, we can come in there, talk to you, maybe give you some advice if you want any. Yeah. Um, look at that, but then you have to rebuild this and, and you know, we'll support you. We'll, we'll show you different things. Yeah. I'm in a, my hometown. I'm a, a here for Thanksgiving and, and talking to my high school class tomorrow. And I talked to, to kids from my high school to give them, give them the word. They, uh, one of those restaurant rescues came here. I don't know if it was Gordon Ramsay, but one of them came here. That place is now a Japanese restaurant. So I mean, it's just like this, and this is sort of the point. So, so when you look at all of these programs and projects, it is great to come and amplify, but, and this is just a, an axiom I've developed. And I said earlier, you cannot presume to improve the condition of someone, something that you refuse to understand the condition of. So you have to go out and, and, and you work amongst the elders, you work amongst the, the government and you say, what, what is the smallest thing that we could do here? You know, and you can ask the farmers, you can ask the business owners. So that's the first thing is you have to get hyper small and don't spend any money. Don't bring any resources. Like if, if the initiative is not, and this is going to go to your, your high school thing, if the initiative is not, and we'll use Afghan, if it's not Afghan inspired, Afghan led, Afghan provisioned, probably shouldn't do it. Now, can you do a forcing action and, and create that thing and, and make everybody grab a paper? Okay, great. But, but that should be the exception. And, and that should be because like, hey, these guys are just stuck. But <clears throat> I would rather they spend more time understanding how religion operates within that society. And we don't even comprehend that. But so like in Afghanistan, we would make these decisions 
and they'd say, okay, we're going to have a meeting. They called it a shura. We're going to have a shura and, uh, and all the shura is a meeting. And then the Afghans are like, yeah, they come and they would perform the act of having a shura. They actually wouldn't make big decisions. And what I realized was, is that if there's not a religious holy man there, who's like, yes, this has happened. Then, then you didn't have the agreement you thought you had. You just had the performance of an agreement. So all of these small elements, eliminating performance, stop making it our solution, stop making it our problem. You know, like what is the main problem here? And and one of the one of my favorite things to do asked to do when I was out out in the field doing spy work was I'd say, what is the smallest thing we can solve right now today? And one of them was um, the road, the dirt road over there where we're going to bring our crop in. It's all rutted. And uh, we need help fixing it. We don't have the tools for that. And so I said, would you go to the government? And I'm like, no, we wouldn't go to the, we want you guys to fix it. And I'm like, well, you got to go to the government. And so we got those guys to go to the government and they're like, said the same thing. And then the Afghan leader looked to the uh, commander and said, hey, you going to fix this? And he's like, yeah, sure, I'll fix it. And so we went out and made a whole thing with it. So you, empow- it's that, so you empowered the local authorities and didn't steal their thunder. Is that the Yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Lesson? And even if it's. Right. Basic question. Right. You know, and then also let him look. The biggest thing I learned in all of my time overseas was uh, that very elder said, look, Pete, uh, we can all have a plan, but there can only be one sword in the scabbard. Mm -hmm. And who's it going to be? And so I go to the commander, I go to the boss, the American guy, and he's an infantry battalion commander. Right. And I say, hey, man, he wants to know who the sword in the scabbard is. And that boss is he's awesome. He goes, you know what? Not me. It's going to be him because we're leaving. And you never hear that. One of the things you never hear from Americans is like, yeah, we've talked to the local government, the the local mayor, the whoever, the president, the senator, the, and and we understand what his or her vision is for the future, and we're going to work within that. And then you you drill down and you're like, where specifically do you need our help? And they'll tell you if you allow them to do it. Otherwise, we just pancake everybody, and just knock them down and just do what we want to do. So that is the difference by being subtle deliberate and uh, a little bit aware humble. that that we can overwhelm things yes maybe a little bit humble oh my god yeah there's no room for ego at all and be prepared for mistakes be prepared to get things wrong absolutely if you're not struggling to keep up in an environment like that you're hurting people and that that's like one of the top rules like if you're not making this is pete's rules if you're not making mistakes then you're making the first mistake so you have to make mistakes because you can't know enough. And, and it can never be about you. One of the, the hallmarks, when I would hear people say things that were wrong on the American side, someone would say, my commander doesn't care about that. I'm like, well, there we go. That right there, that is as important a piece of information as it is is where the next bomb is going to be. So we have an American overriding everybody else's desire because their commander wants something. I'm going to take that to my commander who owns that space and be like, hey, man, we got a problem. And guess what that commander is? They're going to tweak that. They're going to go to the other, the other smaller level commander and be like, hey, dial back. You're too much. And that's what we don't do enough of. You know, some of what you're describing, I remember back at my time in the military and being around it. The way it is currently structured, I feel, works against that. Because every commander has to come in and they have to do something they have to have their make a difference and it's what you're saying though is sometimes the difference is to shut up listen and just establish a good communication with people and you may do very 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 little as you put it but they can have huge effects but we don't see it and if a commander doesn't do things that have a big visual effect that everybody can see they're not going to get promoted they're going to be stuck in the current situation. So how would you, and I believe you have a, a think tape, tank of your own you're sort of creating, how would you resolve this, what I say is a structural problem? Yeah. Yeah, there's also a commander's ethos, right? And that's all part of it. And they want to look after their career. The staff is doing everything they can to make sure that commander has a, has a great tour, right? Everybody's working towards, and I, I talk about like, it's the big arrow of, of things. You get there and it's down here and it's like, do, 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 do. And the arrow goes up and you're like, we won, right? And so you go home and you, you think you've won, but you haven't done your homework. You haven't looked to see what changed. You haven't looked to see how many units before you did the exact same thing, right? And so all the time that's the case. And I love to talk, when I got new to an area, I didn't know anything, but I knew us. 
I'd go to the, uh, the highest commander there and I'd say, hey, I, I work for you. I'm Pete. This is what I do. And uh, I can answer all kinds of questions. And now we say, I, I want to know. I like to do the guy from Texas. I want to know who the most influential man in this valley is. That's the guy I got to talk to. And I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm new here, but I don't know who it is. And they're like, all right. I'm like, it's you. And as soon as you stop being that guy, we can start to get to work. And they meant, hey, we hit those commanders right in the chest. And even if they didn't accept it at that point, they would within a couple of weeks because I'd start showing them how their influence was was causing. Look, my job as a spy is, is to help the commander win. And if your actions are causing you to lose, exactly like you're saying, the structure is there. Now layer in State Department or Department of Energy or Department of Ag, whoever's there, and they have the same problem. Everybody's oriented upwards at their at their boss above them, never to the ground, to, to what's happening around them. And that that's what we're trying to get to change with uh, my, our Ground Truth Institute is to link, look, we have ambassadors in our in our organization and we got practitioners. And the, the ambassadors are like, yeah, man, we don't know what's happening on the ground. We can never get the truth because we're too influential. And everybody's trying to make sure that we have everything that we need, that everybody says yes to us. But we need our people that challenge that so we can do our part of it and fix the policy. And if you're telling me the policy is broken at the ground level, well, then we never get to see that. So that's what we're trying to shrink that gap vertically so that when you do have a commander come out and they have an infantry battalion, you can say, hey, before you operate in this space, y- y- you need to know that we don't need you to do much, right? We, like I-, I would show my commanders, like there's positive things going on all around you, but you never get told that. You get told about death and destruction all the time. Let me tell you what this little fledgling government is doing. And I would show them those positive stories. What do I got to do to get more of that? Leave them alone. They're already doing it. They're already solving crimes. They're already, you know, having babies and throwing party. All of these things are happening and they're using their own government system. But we can't just come in and override everything. And the commanders who are smart got that. And, and look, everybody wants to do the right thing. And there's all kinds of people that are hyper intelligent, that are desperate to do it, that have specialized in this language, in this whatever region. But, but we're so desperate to be great that that we don't slow down good enough to be bad at the job and then learn from there. Wow. That's actually a great point to wrap up on, but I always have one last question, which is my little loaded trigger question. What is the one question that I should have asked you, but I did not? Yeah. You know, I like that. I do the same thing on my show. (laughs) Uh, you should have asked me, hey, Pete, um, what is the IAMPS, my think tank? What are you guys doing next? And then I would have said, hey, on the 16th and 17th at the Army-Navy Club in D.C., we're going to hold a summit and we're going to start this process of talking to the top and the bottom at the same time. And we're going to work on trying to improve the direction and the priorities of our foreign policy so that when we layer in all the subordinate help, that, that it can at least be properly aligned or improve the alignment. How are you going to make people feel comfortable with your think tank? Because there is more bad money, slush money, things like that, that is being run through think tanks. They typically are a parking place for a retired high-level military or civilian in the government having to wait out their period before they go work at Raytheon or whatever for the big money. And it's very difficult for a lot of people to trust in that. And the term itself, think tank, Yeah, it's triggering to a lot of people. So Pete, your responsibility is how do you create a think tank and to my audience, who I think is very suspect of what's going on, how do you say, no, 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 no. This is not like yeah. all the other think tanks out there. Right. But we're different. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Man, I get it. And, and, and that's a great question. And I want that challenge because I want your listeners to be critical because we have wasted a lot of money. We've gotten their people killed, our people killed. I, I did a whole a multi-month long project in Afghanistan trying to figure out a thing called the radio literacy program. And, and the final product was a report. Everybody in our little region got it. And I, over time, I've also been able to go back in time and see how that program had evolved, right? So the ultimate response was from the religious elders and the Afghan elders and the Afghan government, the, the former government that got overturned when we, when we left. And they said, under no circumstances are you deliver, to deliver books 
in our in our region. Do not do it. Don't don't bring them straight to the kids. We'll arrange it with you. We want your help. Here's how we want your help. But it's inappropriate for you to go do this. Well, what happens about a year later? Well, the State Department little patrol goes out in spite of the threats that were in the area, and they got themselves blown up, giving books to kids. Right. So. This is why we have to get better at this, because people do take actions that they think are great. It's going to look beautiful having this pretty young lady named Ann Smedginghoff handing out, and she was a State Department employee. And uh, she got herself, she didn't get herself killed. That situation got her killed, and she shouldn't have been doing that, right? So we have to improve that part of what we do. And that is how we're different, because we have these stories about that power plant that we opened up with that's never produced a drop of power and destabilized the region. The fact is, is that when the Americans show up, we are a net destabilizer. If you don't get anything else from this entire thing, understand that. When we show up, we're net destabilizer. So what we are trying to do is to get us to understand that and then hopefully figure out how to stop being a net destabilizer so that we can reliably at least balance things, balance the ledger a little bit and maybe go forward. So, yeah, and I don't even want to use the word think tank because like you, I'm like, man, forget that. But but that's ultimately what it is. We're going to write papers. We're going to produce projects. We're, we're going to do all these things to hopefully do that. And, and let me just go to your money thing and then I'm, I'm going to help you wrap it up. But if you want to talk to Congress, you know what? I'll have $5,000 ready to drop in someone's lap and say, I'd like a meeting. Here's 5,000 bucks. So to even get their ear a lot of times, and I'm being, I'm being honest, right? Unfair, yeah, but also honest. If you really want to have influence, you got to have money. And if you don't have money, you don't have influence and you're not going to convince the right people. And then ro the rotation happens. You know, we, we switch left, we switch right, we switch left. We, and then people rotate out of chairs. And so you have to always develop that political influence within the House, within Congress, within the White House. And those three things are never in alignment. They're never in alignment. So you're always trying to battle that. So that's one of the big challenges is how do you create enough relevance? And what I think we're going to try to do is just develop partners at, at RAND, at Clinton Foundation, at this foundation, at Atlantic Council. And let's find people that we can work with so we can take the best of what these folks do, run it through our filter, and, and then see what survives. Because if we can't withstand some rigor, then your audience should be upset because we have not done our job. And that's from our ambassadors saying this, generals that we work with, down to Pete on the ground. We've not done our job. We've gotten people messed up. We've wasted taxpayer money. And, and for what? If we could reliably make Haiti a beautiful Caribbean island, well, then we should have done that decades ago. But we can't. So we have to improve or, to your point, just stop going. Well, um, in your um, organization... Will you have anything built in for a transparency to where yeah. people can look into what you're doing and what kind of oversight will you have? Yeah, I want to have transparency and, and we're going to say exactly who we are, what we do. And I, look, I believe in, in ride alongs. You want to come along, come and check out what we do and the passion with what we do it. And yeah, we're going to, we're going to push. Look, running an organization like this costs money. We're going to have to have money come in so that we can be competitive because if you don't have any money, you can't compete. So there will have to be money coming in. And my goal is, and, and I don't know if I'll get it because I'm not the only person in this thing, is to have as close to 100% transparency as possible. I mean, can we show all of our books? Maybe. I don't see why not. You know, And maybe I'm wrong about that. But I would love to be able to say, look, every, every dollar comes in. 80% goes to, you know, whatever it is. And maybe that, I don't know what that well, number like is going to be. I'd like to know who you paid five grand for a meeting. As an example, sure. Yeah, I, I, sure. Some of that. Why not? Some of that would be kind of nice to see. It's like, oh, okay. So, so this, yeah. this, and maybe that has to be done in rears. And some, oh, okay, maybe some time would go by, but yeah, I, I would like to know who actually answers the phone for policy or who has to be paid off, uh, because that tells me something, and that tells the voter something about their representative, whether they are in fact approachable without the money because that is a very disturbing thing it's like okay so you have um critical life-changing material advice but you got to come up with a fee to put it in well wait a minute here Th how this about this seem right. this is just me spitballing this because i want that kind of transparency i don't also want to undermine our ability to work Right. And so there's a balance there. And I don't want to presume that everybody is on the take, although nobody has ever gotten poor by going to Congress. Right. 
So what if um, I'm like, hey, I'm working with this representative in Congress. If you are from that district, let me know. Send an email and see if they respond. Because if I send an email and, and I'm, I'm giving them the money required to have a meeting, then I'm going to get a response, right? But I bet, because I've tried this up with my own representative, I bet if you send an email in and you're like, hey, uh, you're talking with a guy named Pete from the IAMPS, the Ground Truth Institute. Um, I'd love to have you support their cause. I'm looking forward to a response back from you. You're, you're going to get you're going to get a null value. You, you're going to get a zero response. Oh, we're too busy. You're too busy. Well, then why are you? Why do you in this work? Right. So that that would be my challenge. Is like help us have that transparency. Reach out and see see what they say. Because um, I'm glad to talk about the money we spend and where it goes. And it does take look. Here's the thing that that we on the on the outside have to understand. You have to pay good people to do good work. It's not all going to, you can't have 100% going because you're not credible, right? So we have to be able, and I don't mind showing that, like, here's how much we get paid. And if you want to challenge that, well, then let's talk. But it costs a lot of money to take people out of their professional life and put them like, hey, I need you to work 80 hours a week and travel around the nation. Um, well, we're only going to pay that guy 35 no, no, There's no question about that. As a matter of fact, in yeah. uh, trials, for example, you always have to be wary of an expert witness who's not paid. Right. Because right. then they're yeah. an activist. It, it, yeah. There's a customer somewhere. Like the old right. joke, you know, if the product is free, you are the product. <laughs> yeah. So I want to have transparency. And this is not just, look, this is me talking. I'm not just some dude who's like, we're going to have transparency. No, like, look, I want to have it. You have a question, I want to show you. You want to ride along and watch what we do? Come on, then. Let's go. But yeah, it has to be transparent because otherwise, the one of the biggest things I did was I built trust. I built trust with the community that I worked with, and I built trust with the military person. I wasn't part of either group, but I had to develop trust. So I want to learn, and I'm going to screw it up. I have to learn how to develop trust with the greater society. And people are always going to be critical of what we do. That's fine. But the people who are willing to trust us, I want to build trust with them. But I also got to build trust with those policymakers so they quit cutting checks. And, and going, hey, let's, Eric, I've ran into so many people, and my, my peers have too, where they're like, I don't care if this works. My job's here is to spend money. Yahoo, I'm the American. I'm here to help. <laughs> we got to get rid of that attitude. We got to rid of, it's like, who cares where the money goes? We got we to gotta quit doing it. And I know, I know we can make an improvement upon that. Will it make a difference? Man, I hope so. All right. So where can people find out more information about your soon-to-be renamed organization? Yeah, right now, just uh, send an email to me at peterbreakitdownshow.com. That's the best way because everything's everything's being rejiggered and, and we're uh, asses and elbows right now trying to get everything done. So email is good, but the best way, just hit my email and my, my work account for right now. And then um, and then I'll swing into the IMPS side when, when it's time. That's the best place. Or Pete comment A. Turner on, on all video. social media. Right. What's that? Uh, that too. And also comment on this video. Maybe Pete will check from time to time and answer some questions yeah at me on the video and i, I for sure will get back to you because that, that's what i try to do i try to be open with all this stuff all right and well. thanks man i appreciate you talking to me well thank you dude and uh till next time